Welcome everybody here from our TV studio in DNV's headquarters in Oslo. Uh, I'm very pleased to now be joined by uh, Maritime's uh, Environment Director, Eirik Nihus, who's not just a top-notch expert on the topic of regulatory affairs, uh, but also happens to be uh, the host of our famous Maritime Impact podcast. Uh, today, no surprise, Eric, we're here to talk about yet another set of uh, maritime regulations. Now, some have argued that over recent years, maybe the pace of change when we talk about uh, uh, how to achieve uh, net zero and how to decarbonize the maritime industry hasn't been fast enough. Maybe these days we see some more traction and they're certainly happening a lot at EU level. So today we would like to learn a little bit more about EU ETS and what it means for shipping. So let's dive straight into it. So my first question to you would really be, what does EU ETS mean and how will it apply to shipping in the future? Well, thank you for that one. Welcome, Anne. Good to be here. ETS, long story. Uh, started actually way back in 2005. So this is not the case of a new regulation for shipping. It's rather shipping being brought into an old existing one. So it kind of builds on uh, pre-existing mechanisms, but of course adding uh, some tweaks uh, to cater to the mobility of ships. Now, um, it builds on the monitoring, reporting and verification mechanism. That's important to recognize because we got that regulation back in 18. So that's kind of the platform for this whole thing. Uh, but it will, of course, need to evolve and change a bit because so there will be modifications to the MRV incoming. Uh, but first and foremost, I think what our viewers will be most interested in uh, hearing about is when does this kick in? And um, the short answer is it's just around the corner. 1st of January 2024 becomes the first reporting year under the ETS. Now, what that means is that you, as a shipping company, you will be collecting data in 2024. That data will be the basis for calculating your emission liabilities. Those emission liabilities will then translate into so-called EU allowances, carbon credits, if you will, emission allowances, you can many names. Uh, they will need to be surrendered or deleted from a carbon account the 30th of September, the year after you have collected the data. So in essence, 30th of September 2025 will be the first legal compliance point where you actually will need to surrender those EUAs to be in compliance with the regulations. So we have a significant cost impact here. How that is going to work out is something we'll be coming to, of course. Um, but the key point, I think, here is that you as a shipping company, if you are subject to the MRV regulations today, you are covered. If you are subject to the Fjordseen enhancements of the ETS in 2025, uh, for instance, you will have uh, offshore coming in um, that on the M reporting side. It'll come into the ETS in 2027, so you will also need to uh, need to comply. So. We are starting with what we have today, and then with this will be expanding as time goes by. Key point, lots of money that need to be spent. So, Arik, then let's talk a little bit more about the impact you just mentioned, kind of financial implications this will have. So, a few more words on, on the implications for the maritime industry. Yeah. Two uh, sets of implications. Legal stuff, um, where you'll need to meet legal compliance 30th of September, the year after you have reported your emissions. And then um, the commercial implications, which come down to the fact that when you emit in 2024, you start generating financial exposure because those emissions actually translate to um, money. And when you speak of the money here, we have the fact that uh, one ton of CO2 translates to one EUA that needs to be bought or acquired somehow. Today, that one EUA would cost you around 100 euros. When you look at what those numbers mean for uh, shipping, you're looking at roughly 10 billion euros per year at that price level when we get to 2026, when we have full and uh, full effectiveness of the regulation. Now, that's a lot of money. Uh, and you, of course, will want to have this covered through your contracts. Uh, 
And for contracts yet to be established, you can, of course, try to write in those clauses saying that someone else will need to compensate you as an operator for, for those costs. They may not be happy to do so, but uh, you know this is a con commercial negotiation. Uh, but then you still have the f problem, of course, with existing contracts, long-term charter parties that have been established that also need to take care of this. And that means renegotiating contracts. And that can always be a bit co complex. Uh, then you have the issue that, yes, you have your contracts, they are in place, you have done all the necessary work in getting the MRV mechanisms, uh, your MRV reporting, set up appropriately. And that also will take some time. But at the end of the day, when you're going to settle the financials here, you actually need to uh, see that you all are agreed on how much is being emitted. What are the actual emissions from a ship? And there will be disagreements. The charter may have one angle on that. The ship operator may have a different angle. Uh, and you can, of course, wait for your verified MRV emission report under the legal system, under the legal framework, to be made available in 2025. You simply don't have time for that in the commercial world. If you have contracts where you need financials settled early in Q1 2024, you will actually then need to have that data available also in 2024, which brings us to that need for real-time verified emission data. Have someone who that can provide trust in this system where the cargo owner, the ship owner, the charterer, the manager, the operator, all are in agreement on what has actually been emitted. There, will, there may still be contractual issues concerning who is to cover what, but at least you'll have a common data platform to agree on what has been emitted. So you'll be dealing from facts at least and not opinions, which probably would be quite helpful here. Um, I would also say that uh, there is an aspect here when that needs to be taken care of uh, that doesn't necessarily translate to money from the shipping company perspective, but that is going to be important. And that is the fact that this system builds on the MRV. The MRV has been in place since 2018. Uh, to cater to the peculiarities, if you will, that the ETS introduces, there will be changes. We will have new ship types coming in. Uh, we will have new ship sizes potentially coming in. You will have new gases coming in. Methane and uh, N2O, nitrous oxide, is going to be part of the reporting from 2024 and part of the ETS from 2026. You will have company reporting coming in. And company reporting may potentially be quite significant here because what that means is that if you, you are a ship manager, you're the dock holder, you are doing the MRV reporting for everybody. Uh, that means that you are responsible for the meeting the ETS obligations. In essence, you are on the hook for the money. Uh, and if you don't pay up, there will be penalties from the EU. So what do you do if you have some ships in that are under your management where the money flow doesn't work right? So you don't get the compensation that you need to meet your obligations. Not only will those ships be having an issue with compliance wise, but the, the, the way the regulation is written, all ships that are under your management will actually be in the same hold regulation wise and subject to the subject to penalties because it's you as a company that's subject to penalties. So the risk of having some I wouldn't necessarily call them bad actors, but some non-compliant uh, vessels can actually translate into legal consequences for the entirety of the ship fleet of ships under your management. That needs to be dealt with. And one of the ways that you can actually work this is to make sure that when you set up your MRV system and MRV reporting, uh, you will at least have a smoothly functioning system there that allows you to keep track of how the emission liabilities are generated and how the obligations are being met if you have contractual relationships saying that they should be met in real time as you go, which could be an option here. Many varieties, many compl complex ways of doing this, but at least you will have some options if you have a system in place that allows you to deal with this in an um, adequate way in the, in the company at least. In a consistent way, yeah. in, in a way, a single source of truth is, is really what is needed. Yeah. Now, we've talked a lot about the challenge, which is a huge. Let's maybe uh, talk a little bit up about possible solutions. Uh, what would be your recommendation? How could the industry or maybe uh, sh shipping companies to begin with prepare? Um, what do you think? Well, 
I think I've addressed the key issues. We have the legal aspects where you have a bit of time in a sense. You have the commercial aspects where you have no time. Uh, both are uh, fairly imminent, but one of course more than the other. Um, but the ETS is only eight months away. You have to start thinking about this now. You cannot wait. You cannot uh, really delay and say, I will wait and see what happens when this comes around. Uh, because that is when you are going to run into not necessarily the legal issues immediately, but to the commercial issues. Who is going to pay for what? Will you be getting the money you need to meet your obligations? And I think that is the key point. You have to start thinking about this now. And uh, obviously, I would suggest that what you should do if you're watching this and you are wondering what that actually means in practice, you should start talking to your local friendly DNV representative. We will be more than happy to help you in understanding what's coming down the road and getting your house in order so that you're ready for what the future may bring here. Yeah. So if anything, you need to get on top of your data as soon as possible and get prepared. Definitely. Get that and get that right. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today, Arik. Uh, this brings us to the close of this short interview. Thank you.